Casting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running and nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, I hope you're having a great day and you are ready for some Computer America. So in the second part of the program, any time allotted, we'll be doing computer and technology news where we cover all the latest stories just so that you don't have to. Uh, we try to keep up to this you know, on a hour-by-hour, day-by-day basis, and we find it super hard to do ourselves. So we can't imagine... You you know, um, I guess, you know, not surrounding yourself and I guess worrying about technology constantly and still keeping up to date. So that's our job for you. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and pick out the best news stories of the day as we see fit. Uh, but in the first part of the show, and uh, yeah, I'm excited about this. We dedicate the first part of the show to a guest. And today's guest is going to be a company called Bellhops. And if you have not heard about them, then this is going to be exactly what, sorry about that, then this is going to be exactly what you want to uh, stick around for because this is going to be all about uh, moving services and you know trust me as someone who has been dealing with this kind of thing uh, very recently in my own life getting people to your place and helping you with a big move or you know or even just a little move very expensive, very troublesome, and scheduling is a nightmare. It's uh, it needs improving, and I think this is going to be a company that uh, you know they're hoping to do just that. So to tell us all about the service and how it works, we have of course the director of brand and communications for Bellhops, Mr. Kyle Miller, and we'll get to him in just a moment. But before we do, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including a link to our guest website. If you want to check them out, GetBellhops.com. Or just remember, Computer America will have everything in there, links, products, reviews, news, all that kind of thing at uh, at our website in the show notes. So, uh, all that being said, check out the video portion, check out the podcast after the radio show, and uh, yeah, why, why don't we go ahead and get started? So, as I said before, Bellhops, why don't we go ahead and uh, you know just hear it straight from the man himself. Once again, Mr. Kyle Miller. So, we're going to go ahead, unmute, we should be good. Kyle, welcome on to Computer America. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having us on. Our pleasure, our pleasure. And this is, uh, you know, I, I gave, you know, kind of how it relates to something in my life. And trust me, this is a process that uh, I've, I've done a number of ways. You can bribe your friends with pizza. You can hire random people on Craigslist and hope you don't get murdered. You can, um, you know, you can call services or like not, or traditional moving services, which, um, uh, I got quotes like three or four times what I was willing to pay. Very, very expensive. Uh, I hate to sound like a you know ass seen on TV ad, but there's got to be a better way. And I'm hoping that's what you know you're here to talk about. So before we get started, give us a bit of background on Bellhops, the company. When was it started? Um, you know who started it, and then of course a bit of your background and how you found yourself working with the company. Yeah, it, you actually just hit the nail on the head, right? Moving is a really stressful experience and there hasn't really been a lot done to make it a better experience 
at all, um, other than what we're doing as a company. Uh, and when you start to take a look at it and see that people move on average 12 times in their lives and about 30 to 40 million Americans move every single year, you start to realize that there is a huge gap in the industry and a huge problem that needs to be solved. But really, we didn't know that just yet. We started in very humble beginnings uh, on the colleges of uh, Auburn University. And what our co-founders did is they were sitting around and they saw a dorm move in day and they were looking at everyone. They're like, those people need help taking things into their dorms. What if we just offered to take their stuff upstairs from their car to their dorm rooms, just like a bellhop would, uh, and we could help them move in on dorm day. And so they got a few folks together and that weekend they were hoping to do maybe four or five thousand dollars and uh turned out they did about thirty thousand wow. dollars and that's when the light bulb went off right they, they're like there's a business opportunity here but it also started to become very clear that uh there's only two opportunities every single year to move people in and out of dorm um so that wouldn't be a, a full model but the the good news is that people had great experiences working with them that weekend and the next weekend and then they started getting asked can you come and do some things in our homes? And can you do some things uh, at uh, our neighbor's home? And then it was like, can you move us from home to home in our city? Uh, and that's kind of how we started. It was a big evolution of customer demand, then realizing there was a problem, and then setting out to solve that problem with not just great people, but great technology. Yeah, that's that's how some of the best products that we have heard about on the show kind of come about is that you see a need within a market and hey you know you you find the most efficient way to do that and the efficiency i think is where the technology is going to come into play which we're going to talk about here in a moment but i think with um a, you know so all that kind of background uh clearly there was a need and there continues to be a need uh even beyond colleges like you were just mentioning why do you think that uh, that need exists? Because, like you said, uh, traditionally there have been moving, uh, you know, there have been moving companies. This is not a service that is, you know, completely new and out of the blue in the last couple of years. This has been something that I I don't know how far back into uh, you know biblical and caveman times we can go, but uh, people have had stuff and they want that stuff with them. Um, this seems like it should have been you know, there should have been a good, efficient, cost-effective, you know, kind of organized way to do this. Where do you think the companies before you have messed up? Is it, um, you know, is it is it simply labor costs? Is it scheduling costs? Is it, um, uh, where, where do you think you improve uh, with bellhops over traditional moving companies? That's, that's a great question. I think, like, if I could sum it up, it's not being satisfied with the status quo. I think that's probably the biggest problem that moving companies uh, before our time have really uh, experienced. That's the biggest problem that they face, right? Uh, many moving companies out there are doing business the exact same way they did in 1980. Uh, they might have a website and a, a few more technological advancements that they've made that are pretty general practice. But for the most part, uh, the way the majority of traditional movers operate is exactly the way they did in the 90s and in the 80s and beyond that. Uh, and so what we have set out to do is not be satisfied with that status quo, especially when you start to look at that status quo and realize that the average star rating is below three for most moving companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and with us and our investments in technology, uh, we're right now around a 4.9. And so you can see that people are hungry for a better experience. It's just other companies haven't been willing to do it because they feel like they're doing enough as it is right now. Um, and so we set out to make more investments in technology. And now I think people have always been reluctant to use movers because everyone has a horror story. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to change that narrative by building a better experience. And that's where most of our customers come from is word of mouth. Um, and I think that most people are astonished that there is a moving company out there that actually cares. We don't just throw it on trucks, right? We actually do things that show we're an empathetic company that's building to make moving more accessible, more affordable, easier, more on demand, all the things that cost a lot of money, but we know it's the right way to go. 
Yeah, it's um, and and really, I wanted to press you. And you know, uh, for those watching the video portion, uh, you can see the website up there. We're showing that in the background as we talk. And one of the key, you know, kind of uh, numbers that you have up on the website is that you have over two hundred thousand moves completed. And I wanted you to speak to that. Uh, that's a long way from you know moving a bunch of college kids into their dorms uh, over one weekend. You guys have been at. Uh, how long have you been at this? And uh, how how has, you know, 200,000 moves, that's 200,000 properties, people, experiences, uh, how, how has that, you know, kind of changed the way the company's grown, uh, you know, from humble beginnings to today? Uh, how has the company evolved? Yeah, the, the evolution has really been based on two things. One is just continual consumer demand and our consumers coming to us for more and more and more. Um, and then the other piece is really starting to understand the industry and what they haven't done. Um, and so when you look at the industry today, they're using clipboards, they're using walkie talkies, they're not using very complex internal tools, um, whiteboards, things like that. So technology was the first thing. Um, but then also just expanding based on what consumers wanted from us. So we set out to do door moving and like i said the evolution they want us to come in their homes and then do labor only and then move them from home to home and then move them from state to state and as that demand grew so did our commitment to continually investing in technology to ensure that as we got bigger we didn't see these giant cost increase and these giant overheads that we weren't going to be able to make moving more accessible and more affordable for people looking to move today. Yeah, that's and 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 like I said, um, this is something that I'm actually running into right now. We're about to go through a home renovation and getting uh, you know getting labor because I can only move so many boxes uh, myself, and I need someone else on the other end of that you know of, of that China Hutch or something like that. Um, getting labor today or even tomorrow or a couple of days. Um, Man, they make you pay for that. They uh, that on-demand service uh, is not currently, I guess, kind of being, um, you know, kind of being catered to, and, and hopefully, in, you know, that's what Bell Hops has certainly found out. And I really wanted to talk about that on-demand aspect because I think that's something that we've kind of glossed over so far is that the people who work for your company, like you're not just a moving company, uh, you're also talking to our audience. Uh, to let people know that hey, you know, you can work with us as well. Talk about um, talk about the gig economy. Talk about how this has influenced you, and you know, really talk about. Uh, I guess you know, what are you hoping people take away from an interview like this? It, are, are you looking for for people to move others as well as people who will use your, your service to move themselves? Yeah, that 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 is that is exactly. Um, what we're trying to do, both of those things. Um, that a lot of moving companies aren't set up for flexibility. They aren't set up to say, hey, you just need some labor help. We're happy to help there. You just need a truck. We're happy to help there. You want a truck and you want labor. We're happy to help there. You want to move from point A to point B in the city you currently live in. We got you. If you want to move state to state, we have you. Um, and what we were saying earlier is we have done over 200,000 moves and instead of just letting the information that we have and all the data we have just sit there, we've taken all of that data and built an algorithm that makes us more on demand than any other moving company. You know, with us, you can go to our website in about 10 minutes, you're gonna find out how much it costs. Our algorithm is gonna ask you a few couple of, at least a few questions. Um, and in about 15 minutes, you'll have a tailor-made move just for you specifically based off of that information. Instead of us having to show up at your house and give you a quote and do a walkthrough, get you on the phone seven times, three weeks in advance. We've used technology to build an algorithm that literally can tell you exactly what you need by just answering a few questions. So that piece makes it a lot easier for people as well so that they don't have to do the headache and the hassle that a traditional moving company makes you go through. It's almost like jumping through hoops. And, and that gets us into kind of the work experience as well. Um, you, you were asking about the gig economy and the gig economy is really an important thing in mm -hmm. 2020. It was important in 2019 and, and it has been growing ever since, you know, 
in 2018, there was about 57 million people doing some form of gig economy work. And then last year, that went up to 75 million. So in just a year, the number of people looking for gig economy style opportunities has went up over 30%. People are looking for a more flexible opportunity that they can make good money, work when they want, and be rewarded for really performing excellent working on that platform. And that's what we do. We've built a customer experience and a workforce experience that allows uh, the customer experience to be better, but the workforce experience to be better. It, you know, when you can set your own schedule, you set your own hours, and a bellhop is on average making around 21 to $25 an hour. Mm -hmm. That's a really great job. <laughs> And you can work 40 hours a week or you can work 10 hours a week. And that flexibility actually translates into the customer experience. These, this is not a career that some, you know, no one's being a career mover on our platform. They're working when they want, where they want, and how they want. And that allows them to be really a happier worker, which translates into being a happier customer experience. Because the person that shows up at your door, it's not a, somebody that's been moving people for 20 years and hates to show up and has to clock in. It's somebody that's like really, really high quality worker working on our platform. It's like, I want to work two days a week and help people move their lives forward. And they actually really take it to heart. And we see that uh, because of flexibility. And that's actually the number one thing that our movers, who we call bellhop, mm -hmm. tell us uh, is that flexibility is the number one thing that keeps them here. Yeah, that's and, and really, um, I guess every opportunity the people choose to be there, like you said, they don't you know punch in, clock in, and have to go do something. Um, and really, when you say that they're not career movers, what you're saying isn't that you know you can't make a living off this because man, twenty you know twenty plus dollars an hour, uh, however many hours you want, mm -hmm. um, you could definitely make you know some good money at that. You're saying that. Uh, you work the hours that you want. You know, it's it's not a career; it's a job that you get to choose to go to. And uh, yeah, that, that that certainly that seems like it'll be a better experience. And here's my question for you: with in regards to that relationship that you have with your bellhops, with uh, you know the people who choose to work for the app, uh, a lot of other companies have seen them as I don't want to say disposable, but you know, there's always another driver there's always another grocery delivery person there's always another and they'll kind of cut you know they i, I i'm not talking about you know uh the, the revenue share or anything like that i'm talking about um can you know on a continue continuous basis your relationship with the people who use your app uh how how do you feel like you promote people coming back and working for bellhops is that is that uh you know more more jobs is that um uh, I, I, I don't know do you understand what i'm asking like how how do you foster that relationship between your gig workers and yourself as a company that that's uh, i think one of the most relevant questions that, that that you could ask and that we get on a regular basis because we do get compared to a lot of gig economy uh, job opportunities out there. The, the, the difference is driving a car is one thing. Um, moving and going into someone's home, it's a pretty personal experience. It's a whole nother thing. Um, and so there are a couple of ways that we encourage the best bell hops and movers and drivers to stay on our platform. Um, the movers specifically, uh, they start in different stages. So we have a recruit, uh, then the recruit becomes a bell hop. And then the bellhop becomes a captain. And each one of those transitions gives them better pay, gives them more freedom. You know, a captain is the lead on the move. And then a bellhop can be a lead on the move, depending on the type of move it is. Mm -hmm. It gives them more freedom, more responsibility, and better pay as they level up. And so we reward uh, the best bellhops on our platform on a regular basis. And we've created a structure that encourages uh, continual work on the platform itself, because moving is a hard job. Yeah. Groceries, kind of hard. Driving, not that hard. <laughs> moving is taxing. So we want to make sure that we are paying fairly. That's why you see us as one of the highest gig, of pay, gig economy paying jobs out there. But also that we are built a tiered system that allows people to level up. 
Uh, no, that that uh, that answers that question perfectly. And I think my next question, um, you know, again, we're kind of poking through your website as we talk, and one of them, it's it's really a picture of of two gentlemen, you know, moving a stack of boxes into a truck. And I was looking at this picture, and I'm like, that's a good question. Uh, the trucks, the moving equipment, stuff like that. Uh, when you have a gig economy, like you mentioned, you know, uh, let's say for driving, people use their own cars. When uh, they deliver groceries, they use their own cars. Not many people have an 18-foot, you know, truck, or they don't have a giant moving uh, truck and things like that. How do you handle the equipment that it takes to move someone? So just like I was talking about, we get compared to a lot of gig economy jobs out there. We're actually one of the only three-sided marketplaces um, that I know of that exists. I might be wrong, but but mm-hmm. to my knowledge, we're one of the only three-sided marketplaces. We have consumers, drivers, and movers. And there's three types of people that we need to make what we call the perfect move. Um, and the drivers and the movers are separated. The movers are mm-hmm. people who are specifically handling the labor portion. And then the drivers are professional box drivers uh, that drive anywhere from a 16 foot to a 26 foot, uh, just standard box truck. Um, And they show up and the laborers then load the truck and the truck comes with equipment. So one of the qualifications to be a driver is to have one, a truck, have insurance, um, pass background checks and things of that nature, just like the regular onboarding process, but also to have equipment on the truck. And so every single uh, job that isn't a labor only job is going to have your truck and your equipment included in it. And that truck driver is going to come separate of the movers and the movers come separate of the driver. And so uh, this three-sided marketplace that we have ensures that we can be available when no one else is and that we can always get you a truck when you need one. We don't, you know, we don't have a fleet of trucks that we own ourselves, we actually, partner with people, which would be the closest thing to like a list, yeah. but they're professional box drivers. That, and, and that's very interesting. I, I didn't even realize that was part of the business model, but now that of course you've explained it, it makes sense. You, you, you need those people to have the equipment. And of course, I'm sure that the people who own the trucks, uh, you know, even more so working with uh, delivery companies, shipping companies, things like that. Uh, I'm sure that they also appreciate, uh, I'm sorry, they also appreciate a way to make money by owning this truck. And, you know, every, every day that they're not working a job, they're losing money. So, hey, they get to tap into your services to, you know, augment their own income. So and that's great. Makes a lot of sense. Um, let's go ahead and talk about, uh, let's see. So when we were talking about technology and we touched on this lately, um, you mentioned moving college kids, and I think people of a younger generation, they, they're they very comfortable with their smartphone. They prefer online payment. They prefer apps. They prefer um, you know being able to monitor, check, review, all that kind of thing, all within an app. No more clipboard, like you mentioned. No more paper, uh, pens, that kind of thing. So my question is, when you adopted a more tech-heavy, te- tech-centric, um, I guess, kind of process, what did you find, you know, maybe either surprising or, you know, not so surprising, what did you find about, um, I, I, I guess, kind of improvements that you made to the whole process? Like, are people able to monitor the progress on their phone? Are they, um, you know, geolocate so they can, and you might know this better, what is better about using technology as as opposed to the traditional way? So we started uh, with what we thought was the most important piece of technology that we could build. Um, We knew we wanted to use uh, the gig economy model. We knew we needed an asset light model um, to really be able to give cost savings. So that's the biggest burden when it comes to moving. So we invested over the past four years in building internal tools that then speak to a workforce facing app. And so that system that we built um, took a while to really get right. Uh, And so what we wanted to do is build the internal tools that we needed so we could pull away the human touch necessary in the moving process. So we could offer flexible jobs and easy management of those jobs in the hands of the people working on our platform. You know, we really focused on how do we make the best work experience? Because if we can do that, 
then the customer experience will be great. So if the workers are happy, their job is easy, and we have the tools, so there's limited human interaction, mm -hmm. we're actually going to be able to save people a ton of money. Um, and then once we had all of that in place, uh, our internal tools now are powered by our, our order flow, which is in our website. So that was the next step, build a website that makes it easier, faster, and again, without a lot of human touch. So we set out to build a website um, that not only takes all the information that we've learned and makes the process easier, but it also matches bellhop and consumers based off of consumer demand and, and mover availability. And we built all of those tools and now we're starting to see that we're not actually a one use service. Um, people are wanting us to still come in back into their homes and do labor. labor. They want us to do uh, things like deliveries and pickups and all the different things that happen before a move and after a move, packing, all of those things. And so what we're doing now is developing an app, which wasn't completely necessary in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, but a consumer facing app because it's going to be multi-use services and we're going to be offering more and more services um, as the year progresses. Now, I would say the interesting thing that we've learned though is yep. no matter what the investments in technology are, uh, there are still a good amount of people that want to call and talk to people on the phone. And we have an amazing call center um, that operates here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where our headquarters is. Um, and people can call in or they can book online or through uh, the website on their phone, of course. Um, but the, the funny part is uh, we believe so much in our technology and in our algorithm. There's actually not much different happening. So if you call into uh, Bellhop, uh, right now, mm -hmm. and you talk to one of our concierge reps, they're actually going to open up the website and book your move for you through the website. So that's, that's how much we believe in our tools. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that are using a different CRM and doing all this other stuff. We actually just book you through our order flow. We're just doing it for you because a lot of times there's, there's more questions that people have about the experience and things like that, that just a few questions answered don't, don't, don't yeah. satisfy. So, I would say about 50%, 40% come to a, a, a phone call with a, another individual who works here, and the rest find their way through through the website. Um, okay. So that was probably the, the most interesting thing. So as we tooled and, and invested in technology, we also started to learn that we can't just scrap a uh, phone call. Like there, there still has to be uh, some level of, of human touch where if someone wants to talk to somebody, they're available. They're not just getting a robot. They're not just getting a website. They're not just getting a chat box. Because it is a personal experience when you let people in your home. And mm -hmm. a lot of people do want to follow up and hear back from um, us, whether it's via email or via phone. No, I, uh, I I definitely found that even in our own industry uh, with the show here, you know, for the longest time, we had like a mailing list for like 20 years. And I thought, uh, you know, when I first got here, I was like, hey, you know, mailing lists are so old school. We have social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, we don't need mailing lists. And turns out, no, it's uh, the, the traditional stays relevant for a, a long time. But of course, uh, we also appreciate embracing the new, which you have clearly done. So I uh, can definitely say that. So with that being said, for those watching the video portion, we have a map of the contiguous United States with a bunch of little green dots. Uh, no, this is not uh, sickness, coronavirus, or anything like that. This is your service locations. And uh, let's see. So I think, let's see, 30 states, 74 cities. Uh, to get an exact uh, view, of course, we'll throw up a link in the, um, in the show notes. But just talk about... Uh, real quick, if you would, Kyle, talk about what makes a new city a good candidate for bellhops. Is it is it strictly you know kind of grassroots like you know we would really like your service here, or do you kind of have a criteria for which places you're going to bring your service to next? Yeah, so we've tested um, our services over the years in a ton of different cities, different size populations different size uh, geographical areas. And what we really found is that um, the demand to move is really high in mid-sized cities and really metropolitan areas. Um, and so 
that is where we find ourselves launching new cities and exploring new opportunities um, from the East Coast and moving all the way to the West Coast. Mm. Uh, that's how we look at cities and how we, we pretty much select them is based off the population. And once we're in those bigger cities, uh, we start to expand our service areas. So uh, Nashville, Tennessee is a great example. Um, we start in the center of downtown and today uh, we service all the way up to the pretty much the, the line where Kentucky meets and then all the way down um, close to Chattanooga, which is called Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So mm -hmm. while it is Nashville, we, we find these mid-sized cities or these metropolitan areas. And as demand increases, we just increase our service. Um, and that takes us to about 104 million people today that we are actually able to service versus when we first started to total cities. That, that's very, very impressive. And of course, as you said, as time goes on um, and as people recognize the platform, utilize the platform, that will continue to grow. Uh, because really, you know, uh, like we've kind of outlined here, uh, you have made this so that it's not, you know, a central, um, you know, you have to set up, I guess, kind of like the groundwork in each of these cities or each of these states. Um, sure, you know, the people there need to download the app and the people who want to move or help people move uh, have to download the app. But you don't have to have like a physical office in the, in the new city that you expand to. It's strictly digital. Exactly. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, how do you, you, know, you, you, you just said that you ensure that quality workers are on. How do you do that in a brand new city? Mm -hmm. And so we have a team of, of people who work for us directly here at our headquarters that go to that city, set that city up for success and work as captains and work as a uh, bellhop as we start to build our ecosystem of movers in that specific city. Um, and then once the, the scores are right and everything is going well, they start to transition out of that city. So oh. we have a, a group of people that go from city to city to city and set that city up for success. So then we can allow our app to take over. That's interesting. Um, and the cool thing is a lot of those people used to be bellhops. Um, there's a lot of people that work here at headquarters that used to be movers on our app. And we, we actually really encourage those individuals um, to come and apply for jobs because the experience in the field means more experience in our office. It's uh, it, it's almost like you're you're germinating, spreading the seeds into uh, into new places. So that that's a that's a very interesting way, and I can see the merit to it as well. So we, we covered that, and of course, you know, we, we covered the pay that people can have. Uh, you meant, or I don't know, uh, we probably didn't mention yet. Uh, of course, a big part of moving is the fact that people would like to know how much they're going to pay before they go. Talk about your online estimator. Talk about you know the question. Let's uh, let's pretend you're walking someone through uh, the process. What kind of questions would you ask them uh, to give them a quote? Yeah, so uh, we're going to be asking things like the size of the home, uh, how many years that they've lived there, um, and then also what type of rooms they have. And then that's going to tell us how many boxes we anticipate they have. I mean, you know, we, we know what average home has in it. So they tell us that it's this size and we can say like, okay, they have this many beds more than likely. The algorithm says it has this and this. And for the most part, it's, it's about 99% accurate when it comes down to it. Um, so our estimation where we estimate what a move will cost, as long as the customer doesn't go in and change it, it's usually spot on. Now the customer can make adjustments. You know, if we suggest five movers for their move mm -hmm. and it to be X amount of hours, they can actually, you know, adjust that. But we always try to tell people, uh, you know, <laughs> trust the algorithm, trust the technology, because it actually is going to, um, it's, it's telling you exactly how, it's, how much it's going to cost and how many workers it needs. And uh, the only thing we ever run into where that doesn't work and the estimate doesn't stick um, is when people take away, you know, if we say five bellhops and you change it to three or two, mm -hmm. the move takes a lot longer. Um, right. A good example of the move I just did, I, I, I just had my home moved in um, October. And uh, at first it told me, I was like, you need five movers. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot. So I'm really glad that I did that because the entire move took about an hour and a half. And that is loading everything from point a going to point b and unloading it. so what yeah what the last time i moved by myself i didn't work here at the house i moved alone it took right. like two or three days really to get it all accomplished uh i could have done less than an hour and a half and i actually didn't lift any fingers 
so you know it's a win-win there um the way our model works from a pricing standpoint is there's a flat rate um based off of the required amount of time so we always know that a labor-only job on average usually takes about an hour so there's a flat you know no matter what here's the flat rate for the hour mm -hmm. um and then a move that is uh involves a truck or a move that involves going from point a to point b uh that's going to be a two hour minimum for the booking so pretty straightforward there and then anything above and beyond that you're paying as you go in increments and and that will be part of that estimate as well so if we say that your move takes three out three hours you're going to pay definitely the two hour rate and if it doesn't go over the three you don't pay anymore and if it goes into the three then you're paying in a 15 minute increment um but our future state and we're trying to figure out we're very confident in our estimation as i said and um we are working to move to uh, a flat binding quote where it's no longer an estimate. We're just going to say, this is how much a movie is going to cost. And we promise it. Right. And that actually is something that no moving company does. No, no, no. I, I, and, and like I said, we're doing, we are dealing with that now. They give you an estimate and the hours, but of course that always goes up, down and the price that you ended up, that you end up paying, uh, more than likely goes up. So that's, uh, you know, not not preferable. If you can get that one quote locked in, that would be certainly something unique. So, and also, you know, you have a lot of material on, on your sites uh, that people can poke around and find. Uh, one of the big things that I assume is that, let's say you're moving out of a house, you have, uh, you know, you have guides for, you know, um, uh, getting the materials that you need, boxing everything up, you know, making sure that the job that's, um, yeah, the the job that you're hiring people for goes as smoothly as possible because you know there's only so much that uh, your guys can do, or you know that that your hops can do because you know at the end of the day if they have to sit down and they have to pack every little piece of china, um, the job's just going to take longer as opposed to you doing some prep work. So it's um you know they could if if, if you want them to I'm sure that you have seen instances like that, but um, like I said you have a lot of material on your site for people who are looking to move. We, we do. We, we spend a, a lot of time researching the entire moving experience from start to finish and beyond that. So what we try to do on our blog, you can go to getbellhops.com, go over to our blog. And if you're preparing to move, there's tons of organizational stuff. There's tons of information uh, about how to prepare for a move. We actually have a moving checklist that is extremely popular on Pinterest, extremely popular on our website. Um, and it, it will take you from 90 days, 60 days, 30 days, week of, it, it gives you everything. And, and we want to make sure that we have resources there for people when we can't be there for them, you know, changing your address, doing all these little things that come along with moving. Cause our goal is to make it as stress free as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also what's the follow up look like, you know, you just moved to a new city. We have, we have these things we call city guides that will actually take you through everything that we have researched to find in that city that we think you should check out everything that we think that would be best for you uh, to do places to eat uh, school systems all these different things we've put together so if you are new and you just moved to a place and we've moved you in it doesn't in there we actually have resources available for you after the fact as well so you can better understand your community and your neighborhood because you're brand new there um, and then also anything that, it, that you need when it comes to organization um, or if you need any labor services from us for, you know, doing things around the house, moving couches, things like that, which a lot of people who can't do that on their own actually take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, um, one thing that I didn't notice here on the site, because you do have restrictions on what you can move, people should know. Things like ammunition, uh, you said things like alcohol, medication, um, really, you know, kind of personal sensitive things that uh, you should probably be handing yourself anyways. But uh, one of these, I'm, I'm kind of you know, not surprised, but I see it as an opportunity for, um, you know, for, for what it is that you're doing. Um, because again, we're having to deal with this ourselves in, in, in my personal life, uh, oversized items. They're, they're not fun. They're very challenging. They are usually their own job when you hire a company such as bell hops or any other moving company. Um, oversized items can include pool tables, hot tubs, pianos, grandfather clocks, like you have listed here. Um, any interest in, uh, like, I know right now you exclude those from what you're willing to handle. Um, any any thought around the office that maybe 
you know, make it its own category, but you know, we should get into this. Yes, that, that, that is a really good um, point and one that we are actually actively, hopefully close to solving. Um, all those items that you mentioned are items that, uh, while they are called oversized on our website, um, probably a better word that, that people should understand is that they are technical, they take a, a technical skill um, mm-hmm. that we, we can't teach someone and that, 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 that a tiny bit of information won't change, right? You know, taking apart a grandfather clock and if you move a grandfather clock, it, you could ruin it, right? Yeah. Same thing with a piano, it's out of tune, you could break it. Um, items like a pool table, which are extremely, extremely heavy. Uh, and then a hot tub, of course, takes a lot of skill to move as well. Sometimes cranes, it just depends on the nature of it. So what we're doing is starting to figure out how do we find specialists in these fields and then put them in this same gig economy pool where they can take these work work opportunities where we're missing out on helping these people um, who need help moving and are looking for really an alternative to kind of the outdated model itself. Makes make sense. So my, my last question, and and I apologize for keeping you over uh, this interview's lasting uh, longer than, you know, I, I kind of, longer than I quoted you, but hey, this is uh, this is the nature no of problem. things. So I, I, I do have one more question, and this has to do with moving people from city to city. Um, obviously, if let's say you are in Chattanooga and you want to move somewhere else that does not have um, bellhop service, so you know, uh, so they are, there, there is service where you're moving from. Uh, you can get someone to pack up a truck and the truck can go anywhere. Uh, what happens when you choose a destination that does not have that service? It, like, is it door to door? As long as you have a starting location, it, you, know, you can use bellhops to end it. Or do you have to align something or I'm sorry, do you have to arrange something on the other end of that trip to unload the truck and you know, at the new property? Right. Yeah. So um, if it's in a city that we don't operate in, so we would handle the loading, you could actually get the truck and the truck would go to that city. But then you'd have to figure out if you're going to unload it or if you're going to hire someone um, other than Bellhop to do to do that piece. Um, that's why we're launching so quickly in so many cities. Uh, I just in 2017, we're in about 20 cities. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can see the velocity at which we're, we're launching cities is, is extreme. Um, and if it happens, uh, that a lot of people are coming to us and want a specific city. Um, we work really hard to ensure that it's part of our launch schedule. Um, so we, there, there's not an exact solution to that. But the good news is um, when it comes to long distance moving, again, we're actually a lot cheaper than our competitors. And one of the reasons is uh, if you are in two cities uh, where we do operate, um, unlike most moving companies, you're paying for the labor at point A, the truck leaves and the laborers do not go with the truck. So you're only right. paying for the truck and the driver. So you're not paying for two more people at an hourly wage. Right. And so the truck goes and then the laborers at the next spot are there because you know the Chattanooga laborers load the truck, the truck goes to Charlotte and then the Charlotte uh, laborers then unload the truck. And so if you are going from city to city, uh, it is, way more cost effective but even if you're if you're going to a city that we don't operate in you're still yeah. not having to pay that truck services to um to that other city and and, and of course it works the other way as well where uh, if you can load up the truck and the truck can go uh you can have bellhops of course meet you meet you in a city that they do service and unload the truck for you so hey that could uh, that could certainly be helpful as well so no right. you, and, uh, and we actually do sure. sh- uh, shipping containers too so oh. it's, you know we actually just started that, um, and so you could rent through our partner Zippy Shell um, or Packrat. You can rent um, their storage shell. Uh, we load those up for you, and then it's delivered to your next location. And then you can figure out um, unloading it if we don't operate there, or if we do operate there, then we'll just be there to unload it. Right. Bye. No, that, that that's very very convenient. I'm glad that you are making partners within you know within the industry because hey, I'm sure that there are a lot of people that would 
like to not be excluded, but to better integrate themselves with your service. So uh, I think that's about all the questions for the service that I have. I do have one more kind of topic I wanted to, you know, to talk to you with Kyle, and that has to do with the scholarship. And, and, and I definitely love it when companies come on the show and, you know, they have a purpose, they have some kind of charitable endeavor, they have something that, you know, kind of gives back to their community. And I think, let's face it, a lot of, I'm sure your bellhops, a lot of people that, you know, use your app to help people move, um, they, you know, a, a lot of people that work for you are going to be college kids. A lot of people that are going to be using your services are going to be moving in and out of dorm rooms or their first houses and, and things like that. Talk about the scholarship that you have set up and why you decided a scholarship was a good way to go. And, 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 and just really, how's that been for you? So we have always looked at our roots as starting in college, right? That's where the idea came from. Um, and so what we wanted to start doing is figuring out ways to give back. And every year that kind of changes. And every every year we, we get a little bit better um, at, at that investment. And whether that's going fully into sponsorships or figuring out a scholarship program, something around education has always been important to us because Education really has been our lifeblood, right? So we started on college campuses. Our workforce is predominantly um, in college. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are always looking for ways that we can give back and, and reinvest in the community that's given back to us. Perfect. Uh, and, and of course, um, you know, everyone can see it there. And like I said, I, I just really appreciate when companies are more than just, you know, here's our headquarters and here's our product and that's the end of us. Um, so I, I definitely want to draw a little bit of attention to that. So uh, with that being said, uh, Kyle, I'll go, ahead, I'll go ahead and let you have the last word. Is there anything that we didn't talk about, any uh, topics we didn't touch on that you think that we should? The, the only thing that, that I think I can add is, uh, you know, go visit getbellhops.com. Check out what we do, even if you're not moving. Um, look at what we've done and and just just take a little bit of stock in it because i'm it's guaranteed that someone somewhere is gonna say hey can you help me move this weekend and we can be your answer for that right <laughs> so you can say actually i can't help you there is a on-demand moving service that is available in our city so use them it won't cost you that much money you know, I, I and, and and truly and honestly, uh, I had a friend that moved in uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth area, Texas, and they had to almost, you know, move houses uh, by themselves, and that was about a year and a half ago. So I really, really wish that you know Bellhops was brought to my attention because I was states away, and I could have just sent you guys over to uh, to assist with that. So I will say, though, that uh, I want to thank you so much, uh, Kyle Miller, again, the Director of Brand and Communications for Bellhops. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for, you know, talking about this service. It's, it's something that's, uh, I've been doing this for seven, eight years. I have not heard of something like this. Of course, the gig economy, as you said, is evolving year over year. And hey, you have an, you have an exciting form of it. So thank you for sharing with us. Thank you so much, and, and good luck on your move. And we're actually coming to Greenville pretty soon, so that means we'll expand into Asheville as well. So absolutely, we're there for you at, about summertime, hopefully. Yeah, I I, I, um, I actually had a job in, in Greenville a couple of years ago, and great place. I'm glad that you're expanding there, and look forward to a lot more places. So uh, until next time, Kyle. Uh, you know, if, if really open invitation. If you have anything new to announce, love to have you back on. But in the meantime, thank you for your time. And once again, everyone, get bellhops.com, computeramerica.com. We'll have a link in the show notes after the show, of course, airs on the radio and after the podcast. But hey, computeramerica.com will have all the information there for you. So Kyle, until next time, have a great one. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. So there he goes. And we're going to go ahead and continue on with computer and technology news in the last... 10 minutes that we have and we hope that you enjoy that so obviously that is just a service that hey will help you move and hey if you're looking for a job well hey maybe you can work for them hmm. gig economy it will never cease to amaze so with uh why don't we go ahead and get started with computer and technology news brought to you by computer america <laughs>
So a lot of different stories that we can, of course, uh, you know, that we can, of course, focus on. And I think the first one we're going to do is, um, okay, how about this one? This is another gig economy story, but it's actually about Grubhub. Grubhub, if you're not familiar, it's a service that will bring you food from any restaurant, well, any restaurant that they partner with, to your door. There's a little problem with that sentence I just said. The problem being, sometimes, they don't actually partner with the restaurants that they say they do within the application. So, Grubhub's new growth hack is a listing restaurants that didn't agree to be listed. And of course, you could see where this could come in handy for Grubhub if they decide, you know, uh, people really enjoy uh, insert restaurant here. Then if they could list that as a local favorite and they can list it as, hey, this is somewhere you can get food from, to the, you know, to the people delivering the food, they go there, they get takeout, you know, it is what it is. But to, uh, you know, and to the end user, they get the food, no big deal. But from a business perspective, those partnerships are not always, well, you know, actually real. So let's go ahead and get into this. This is actually coming to us from The Verge. Grubhub has a new growth hacking strategy that includes creating a restaurant listing on its platform for places that don't even partner with the service. And that's according to the San Francisco the San Francisco Chronicle and tweets by restaurant owner uh, by a particular restaurant owner. He has a really long last name. Please don't let me, please don't make me do it. Grubhub has been allowing customers to order food from his website from restaurants that haven't technically haven't technically signed on uh, signed up to be on grubhub or its subsidiaries so of course disclosure um yeah the author's parent actually owns a uh, restaurant that partners with grubhub so there you go but the restaurant owner in particular explains in a twitter thread that over the weekend she received a call from a customer claiming that their order hadn't been delivered the only problem the restaurant doesn't offer takeout or delivery so they said that grubhub owns multiple food directory services including seamless eat 24 menu pages and all menus did not know that very interesting to know and it's not alone in the practice competing services postmates and doordash also host restaurant listings and their menus on on their platforms even if those businesses don't offer delivery or have never agreed to partner with of course the service Postmates, however, claims that technically it doesn't need explicit partnerships from restaurants where a pickup service uh, representing the customer were not a delivery service representing the restaurant. There's the big difference. As I said before, um, in a lot of these in instances, um, it's, not really going to, it's not really going to matter because the restaurant gets a customer, Grubhub has a delivery person, and the person ordering the food gets their food. At the end of the day, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. The problem is where this particular restaurant ran into, which is where customers expect a delivery service. And if they don't um, actually have that delivery service, that's where you can hurt their reputation saying, oh, I'm never going to order from there again. And then the restaurant's just, just sitting there like, we never delivered in the first place. And that can hurt their revenue. So they mentioned Grubhub removed listings to her restaurant and said that it only added her restaurant since it was deemed to be in high demand. Uh, a little bit of flattery. And this is uh, this is what Grubhub told The Verge on the statement. Starting, quote, starting a couple months ago in select cities across the country, we'll add restaurants to our marketplace when we see local diner demand so that the restaurant can receive more orders and revenue from delivery uh, completed by our drivers. It's our aim to bring the best delivery experience possible while balancing the interests of our diners, restaurants, and drivers in complying with all local laws and regulation in connection with our business. So here's the thing, uh, and of course Postmates takes a similar stance, and, and by the way, end quote, uh, Postmates takes a similar stance. If you don't want takeout, they should message across their internet presence that customers aren't going to search for it, as in, you know, hey, if you have a particular favorite uh, restaurant and they don't do, do delivery, Postmates claims that, um, and of course Grubhub claims that if they don't want to do delivery, they need to make that very clear and apparent across their online presence. Personally, I think they're a little bit wrong on this. 
It seems like, of course, small businesses that can't handle a large influx of new customers, you know, just on the flip of switch, um, would be hurt by this. Of course, you have customer reputation, like I mentioned, and just the fact that, hey, maybe they just don't want to do uh, carry out or take out or, or things like that. My immediate reaction to this is, well, why not? A phone call why not a letter why not an email why not some way to reach out to these restaurants that you are suddenly you know kind of automatically adding why not um you know reach out to them and say hey we're going to add you to our platform you know if you're dead set on adding people who you know and not giving them a choice why not say hey we're going to add you to our platform would you like to further integrate, you know, come on board? If not, we're just going to direct people to here, here, and here. Be very transparent about what it is that they're going to do. Or on the other hand, just say, oh, we couldn't reach out. Um, they did not apply. They did not uh, respond to our request. Uh, we're not going to add them. Really, what I would recommend is open conversation between the restaurant owners and Grubhub, Postmates, DoorDash, whatever. Uh, that would just seem like the best practice as opposed to just, you know, going behind everyone's back and just trying to do things on your own. So they, uh, let's see. So some of the other things they mentioned that, uh, of course, some companies just don't want to work with Grubhub because uh, of the interface, restaurant orders, disputes between Grubhub and the restaurant. And of course, if they go back and add you without, um, you know, without saying anything, eh, you know, you can have a problem there. So ordering food can often be convenient, but increased competition from delivery services is ultimately hurting many local businesses. If you want to make sure that your money benefits your community most, of course, you can order from the restaurants directly. So there you have it. Uh, that's it for that story. And I hope that further communication between these uh, definitely takes off. Let's, um, yeah. Let's go ahead and continue on with this. I, we only have for like one more story, and I think our next story is going to be this one. And you know, it normally this would be a very, very long article. Apple and its Wi-Fi chip company Broadcom ordered to pay 1.1 billion with a B dollars to university over iPhone patents. So. This happens across the United States all the time. One of the best uh, things about academia and really our college system is that so many get uh, autonomy and so many get the ability to patent their own work. You know, what happens in a research lab on a university has real world implications. Now, while I think this is a short story and why I feel comfortable bringing this up uh, just a couple minutes before the end of the show is that it's Apple. We saw the behemoths of the world, the Apple versus the Microsoft, the Apple versus the Samsung, the Apple versus, well, really everyone. Apple is uh, Apple's in a lot of legal disputes with everyone. I don't think there's any kind of number that could phase them anymore. But I will say that when Apple does this, they will drag this out with appeal after appeal after appeal. And even though they may have lost this particular, they may have lost this particular court battle, they undoubtedly are going to appeal this. They're not going to pay $1.1 billion. And if the university thinks that they, you know, just made a billion dollars, hmm, not so much. Now, do I think that Apple is right because it is larger than everyone else and it can appeal uh, court cases all the way up to the, to the Supreme Court? No. Uh, let's see. So the issue at hand here is that the uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech, which claims that Broadcom, which is the company that uh, Apple owns, uh, the Wi-Fi chips used in hundreds of millions of Apple iPhones infringed four of its data transmission patents. So, uh, let's see, in court filings, Apple says it believes all the university claims against it came from the use of Broadcom's chips and its devices, calling itself merely an indirect downstream party. Uh, the software products manufacturer supply, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, who knows? 
So with that being said, Apple was ordered to pay Caltech $837 million and Broadcom to pay $270 million, together $1.1 billion. This is going to be appealed. Um, best of luck. It seems like both sides are not talking because it is now a matter for the courts. So everyone, that is about it for Computer America. There's the music softly in the background. Um, oh, my bad. Here we go. So, everyone, that's about it for us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off here. If you would like to find out more about Computer America, computeramerica.com. You can, of course, find uh, reviews, show notes. You can find products, articles, op-eds, past shows, future shows, the video portion, podcast, and more, all at computeramerica.com. Reach out, uh, reach out to us on social media. We love to hear from you. And uh, if you have any recommendations for future guests, hey, we'll do our best to get them on. Just drop us a line and we'll be sure to work on it right away. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into Computer America. Really, we appreciate it. And hey, have a good one. Bye, everyone.